Good morning, church. Now let us pray together before the sermon. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in Thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. While I was preparing for today's sermon last week, I read a short fiction based on the story of a famous pop singer from a small town in Taiwan. In the beginning of the narrative, Serena had all the elements of bodily beauty, and she established close friendship with two other Taiwanese girls in her band, Hazel and Elsa. Yet, having become so famous. At her early twenties, Serena was gradually traumatized by the world of fame and spotlights. She suffered from eating disorder due to her attempts to maintain her body shape. She was scared by the thought of dating and marriage, worrying that a committed relationship may affect her career. She even left the band behind after ten years of sisterhood with Hazel and Elsa. Hoping to get more work opportunities on the other shore of the sea, until one day she was caught in a tragic fire when she went for a concert in mainland China. Her eyes were suddenly open to reality. Serena was seriously burned and left alone at hospital. She felt unspeakable loneliness when no one nearby showed up to visit her. No colleagues, no lovers, not even the media chasing her all along. At that moment, she eventually realized the vanity of her pursuit for bodily beauty and fame. She wept night and day for her own sufferings and for others who also suffered from the burning accident at hospital. But finally, out of Serena's surprise. Hazel and Elsa traveled hundreds of miles to visit her in China, visiting her and inviting her to return to Taiwan and sing with them again, not just as a band, but as a family. With their warm companionship, she began to appreciate her own wounded body, and grew in affections with these sisters in the spirit. As she walked on this journey of healing with them. Serena was transformed into a more caring person, committing herself to a sisterhood of mutual love and life together with Hazel and Elsa. Now, in today's scripture, Ruth and Naomi also clung to something meaningful to keep going on their journey with bittersweet commitments. In the beginning of Ruth one, during a famine never mentioned in the book of Judges. Elimelech moved his family from Bethlehem, which literally means the house of bread, to Moab. Then, unfortunately, he died, and so left his wife Naomi and two sons, Mahlon and Kilion, in the foreign land. Whether his death is associated with the move is unexplained in the scripture. The sons then married local women, not only were Opa and Ruth Moabites. That is, members of an already stereotyped nation for Israelites, but their marriages were childless when the sons unfortunately died ten years later. Supposedly a land of plenty, Moab proves to be the place of infertility and death. In the grievous loss of almost all her security in a patriarchal society, the Israelite widow Naomi. After hearing that there was divine provision of food in Judah, resolved to return to Bethlehem. In verse six, her daughters-in-law accompanied her, but she repeatedly urged each of them to return to their own people. Not once, but twice. In verses eight through thirteen, eventually, due to Naomi's art of persuasion, Alper gave her a kiss 
apparently to bid her farewell. But Ruth was not so easily persuaded. Ruth, assuming the closest of physical position a woman takes to another in the scriptures, clung to Naomi and refused to leave her, which echoes the mar marital relationship expressed in Genesis 2.24. Therefore, a person leaves their parents and clings to their spouse, and they too become one flesh. But Naomi tried again, couching Alpa as a role model and inviting Ruth to follow her lead in verse 15. Like Alpa, Naomi thinks that Ruth should not only return to her people, but also to her gods. Yet Ruth was unmoved. Instead of complying with Naomi's wishes, she launched her own discourse in verses 16 through 17. She insisted that Naomi's people and God would become hers. She vowed to pledge with and be buried with Naomi, which again, which again sounds more like a spouse than a daughter-in-law. She even concluded with a statement that God should strike her if there were anything but death to part them, which is often adopted in weddings today. To death do us apart. For queer folks, this declaration of love and affection means a lot in affirming same-sex intimacy, which paves the way toward new possibilities of family structure and is shown in Serena, Hazel, and Elsa's story in the beginning of the sermon. Now with a closer look at this famous speech of Ruth, we could notice that it, it nullified any restrictions that could prevent a Moabite daughter-in-law from accompanying an Israelite widow to her homeland. Ruth pointedly refused to affirm any of the fears previously voiced by Naomi. Instead, the response directly cut to the chase by highlighting the net ethnic and religious fears hidden in Naomi's misleading talk about marital security and her description of a bleak future for her daughters-in-law. Ruth even used Naomi's persuasion against herself First, there is a repetition in Ruth's response, which seeks, no, seeks to under, uh, undermine Naomi's arguments. And second, Ruth followed Naomi's lead in using a lot of emotive terms to further her persuasion. Such is the case in verse 17. Building upon Naomi's retelling of the past death of her husband and sons in verse 8. Ruth clearly used inevitable death of both women in the future to underline her willingness to remain with Naomi even until then. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. This is emotionally colored by the past experiences of loss shared by both women. Since the speech appropriately ends up with a solemn oath that nothing but death will make them apart. Despite the sting of death that separates Naomi from her children and her husband, by this very proclamation, Ruth indirectly assumed her role as Naomi's permanent family, just as Hazel and Elsa assumed their role as Serena's permanent family in the opening story. As the only oath formula in the entire book of Ruth, chapter 117 heavily contributes to Ruth's portrayal by emphasizing the strength of this commitment. It also crowns her persuasive strategy by evoking God as a witness to her pledge and inviting God as its enforcer. It was at very point that Naomi realized that there's no use for her to drive Ruth away. And thus, she said no more to Ruth. 
Now there is an interesting parallel between Ruth's move from Moab to Judah and Abraham's move from Haran to the land of Canaan in Genesis 12. Like Abraham, Ruth was willing to leave her home for God's promised land. But unlike the patriarch, she was motivated by love and loyalty toward her mother-in-law, not by divine command. Nor did she have any promise of land or children. Her future was rather full of gender and ethnic uncertainty, which made her decision to co journey with Naomi even more extraordinary than Abraham's move. Her faithfulness for her mother-in-law, which was expressed through disobedience in verses 17, and even though, and even through silence in verses 18 to 22. This also shows us today that true commitment toward one another is not fixed to one single form. Sometimes it is expressed through disobedience. Sometimes it is expressed through silence and companionship. In the spirit of this loving kindness that constantly motivates us to come out from our comfort zones, we are also called to co-journey with one another in creative and sensitive ways as Ruth did. So how about Naomi? If Ruth was fully committed to Naomi, who was Naomi committed to? According to Ruth 1, the answer seems to be God. In verse 6, as soon as she heard that the Lord had considered their people and given them food, Naomi set out from the land of Moab toward the land of Judah. Despite her distress and bitterness toward the hand of the Lord turning against her, she still put herself up to bless her daughters-in-law with God's kindness and security. But Naomi's view of her misfortune from God accompanied her to Bethlehem. While the whole town was stirred at both travelers with mixed feelings of joy and shock, Naomi was so stirred up inside that she couldn't help but to pour out all her grief and anger with a lament in verses 20 to 21. She said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. As we can see, she rejected not only the greeting, but also her own name, which means sweetness. In verse 20, she insisted that she should be called Mara, which means bitterness, because she believed that the one she was committed to had betrayed her trust. As readers, we know that Naomi had not left Bethlehem full, as she claimed since she actually left Moab as a result of the famine. Nor has she returned empty, because even though all the verbs and pronouns using Naomi's lament are in their singular forms, Ruth was undoubtedly by her side. Even when her husband was not by her side calling her sweetie anymore, Ruth would always be there to call her sweetie. And it was precisely Ruth's faithful actions for Naomi in the following chapters that eventually turned her bitterness back to sweetness, her emptiness back to fullness. Although in her great distress, Naomi failed to acknowledge Ruth's loving kindness at this time. So if Ruth's commitment to Naomi is faithfulness through disobedience, the Naomi's commitments to God and to Ruth are undoubtedly sweetness through bitterness. Now with a closer look at the lament of Naomi's, although we could somehow empathize with her struggles, we're still not able to fully imagine the depth of her grief and anger after all her sufferings. The loss of her loved ones the anger toward her God 
who not just fall, uh, not just allowed, but brought calamity upon her. All these things were not fully revealed until this heartbreaking cry. She tries so hard to trust in God's gracious provision once again. She tries so hard to pull herself up and bless her daughters-in-law with something that even herself was struggling with. But as soon as she arrived at her homeland and heard someone calling her sweetie, sweet things with her husband, her sons, and her friends that were stuck in the past all began to flash back. Which suddenly made her heart too bitter to pretend any longer that she was okay. Instead, she shouted out, "No, I'm not okay. Look at me, God. Look at me. See how you have made my life a mess." As modern readers, such a lament, probably echoing the lament of Job, might appear to be disturbing, because, quote. They can lure into open experiences, memories, and feelings many people prefer to deny. They can expose realities that communities and individuals dismiss from consciousness because seeing them might undermine their worlds. Unquote. But for me, this spirit of lamenting is a key to more genuine ways of our spiritual life. It opens up a safe space. For strength and weakness, for delight and sorrow, just like our congregational prayer every Sunday, just like what we have experienced in our community in this whole pandemic time. As Kathleen O'Connor suggests in her book *Lamentations and the Tears of the World*, quote: "Although laments appear disruptive of God's world, they are indeed acts of faith." In vulnerability and honesty, they cling to God, and demand for God to see, to hear, and to act. Laments can shred the heart and spawn despair, but by mirroring pain, they can also comfort the afflicted and open the way toward healing. Unquote. Now the town's women surprise. Naomi's lament and Ruth's silence—all these heard or unheard female voices—leave us in suspense for the following narrative. In verse twenty-two, it says, "They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the harvest of the harvest of barley. See, a barley harvest." Bethlehem, after all those years of famine and emptiness, was eventually worthy of its name, that is, the house of bread. As readers, we can't help but to wonder: Is this a sign of divine provision coming for Ruth and for Naomi? Is this a sign of hope that their bitterness will be turned to sweetness and their emptiness will be turned into fullness? The answer is yes. Having walked through the journey of pain and despair together, in chapter one, the two women were about to receive blessings and rewards from God for their mutual commitments in the following chapters. But more importantly, having clung to their commitments despite their shared pain and hardship, in chapter one, Ruth and Naomi would continue to show their vulnerability. And act honestly as wounded healers and loving companions for one another. Later in our worship service today, we'll come before God to partake the body of Christ broken among us. As we follow the God who listened to the passionate profession of Ruth and the heartbreaking lament of Naomi, we are also called. To follow the spirit of loving kindness that constantly calls us to become wounded healers and loving companions for one another, may we follow the spirit of lamenting that brings more genuine ways to our spiritual life as Naomi did. May we come out from our comfort zones and co-journey with one another in creative manners 
as Ruth did. When we gather together around the table during the communion, may we be infused with and strengthened by God's healing grace that empowers us to go into the world and heal all God's people, just as our hearings did for one another in today's stories. Thanks be to God. Thank you.